A rear locking differential. Do you need one? Yes, you do. I also need one. I got pretty far without one, thanks in part to Toyota's A-Track, which is a pretty great low-speed traction control that transfers the power from the slippy wheels to the grippy wheels. But I've encountered enough situations where the grippy is still too slippy and I either have to turn around or spend two hours digging myself out. So it's time for a locker. I was reluctant to do the locker in part because it was going to cost me $2,000. $1,000 for the diff and another $1,000 to have somebody install it. Why is it $1,000 for installation? Apparently it requires special tools, but I bet I can do it with just regular tools. There's the right way to do something, and then there's also the easier and cheaper way that, let's be honest, will probably still work. Today we're going to be talking about the latter. We're going to install a locking rear differential in my fifth generation 4Runner. Specifically, we're installing this ARB air locker. It's easy, it doesn't take a whole lot of time. I didn't actually need any special tools, though I will admit I took a couple shortcuts. This took me about half a Saturday and can be accomplished with basic hand tools and a $100 trip to Harbor Freight. I was curious how this thing works, so I took it apart as soon as I got it. It works just like an open diff, except that when it has air pressure, there's an extra gear that slides in and grabs one of the spider gears, preventing it from moving. Since this spider gear can't rotate, none of the other gears can rotate, and the whole thing is locked. When you remove air pressure, this wavy spring pushes the gear back and allows the spider gear to freely rotate. To get air pressure into the diff, this seal housing is clamped into the carrier and doesn't rotate. The seal prevents air from escaping. The air goes into this little hole which pressurizes the area behind that locking gear that slides towards the spider gear. Before you start, you're going to need new bearings. ARB is not super clear about this, nor which bearings you need, but you do need them, and this is the part number. These are 50 millimeter inside diameter bearings. Get two. You might be able to pry off the old bearings and press them onto the new diff, and I like being cheap, but I don't recommend being that cheap. Before you start tearing apart your differential, press the new bearings on. You'll need a press for this, and you'll need a short piece of pipe with an inside diameter of 2 inches. If you don't have anything lying around, just go to McMaster and give them $11 for this part number. You can use just about any hydraulic press for this, uh, but you do need a press. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I don't need a press. I can just tap it on with a hammer, right? I know you're thinking this because I was thinking this. This is probably not a good idea, but if you try it, let us know how it works out in the comments. For the rest of you, just swing by Harbor Freight and pick up their cheapest hydraulic press. Or better yet, do like I did and swing by work on a Saturday when nobody's there and use their awesome hydraulic press. Once that's all ready to go, we need to jack up and support the vehicle, then drain the diff fluid and remove the drive shaft. The drive shaft bolts are real tight, so prepare appropriately with your biggest breaker bar. Once the bolts are loose, just a gentle tap with a hammer should do it. To get the differential out, you first need to remove the axles. There are four bolts that hold the axle flanges on. Take these four bolts off both sides. You don't need to remove the calipers. Also, take off this one bolt here that holds the brake line. I'm going to tell you something here that you should probably thank me for. You need to remove the sway bar bolts before you can get the diff out. This is not obvious, and I wrestled with this 8 billion pound steel pumpkin for way too long, unable to see why it wouldn't come out. So just unbolt both sides. I hate bleeding brakes. It is straight up impossible to do it without getting brake fluid everywhere. And anyone who says otherwise is either a liar or a wizard. I want brake fluid all over the place, only slightly less than I want to pay somebody else $1,000 to do this, but I really don't want either of those things. So let's see what we can do. It turns out you don't actually need to take off the brake lines, you just need to unclip them here and slightly bend them to get the axle out. Thank God. I hate brake fluid. Take the bolts out of the carrier and pull it forward. It's super heavy and kind of awkward while you're laying under the car, so be prepared for that. So when you get it out, the first thing you need to do is mark the bearing caps. They need to be installed on the side they came off of and in the same orientation. They machine these things as an assembly, so if you switch sides, you're not going to have that nice round machine hole anymore. You'll also need to check the backlash. You need a dial indicator for this, so if you don't have one, now is a good time to go buy one. You'll feel like a total professional with this piece of precision machining equipment that you bought from Harbor Freight. My backlash was about six thousandths of an inch. Rotate and check a couple of different places to make sure. 
The instructions tell you to measure the old backlash so you can set the new backlash to the same amount, but the truth is you can set the new backlash to anything within the acceptable tolerance, which for this vehicle is between six and ten thousandths of an inch. Alright, this is where I really differ from the instructions. If you read the instructions from ARB, there's a big warning about how a differential spreader is required and how you will damage your shit if you don't use one. I didn't use one. This diff uses tapered roller bearings that need to have some axial load. Toyota accomplishes this with some shims that they stack up to the whole assembly to make it slightly longer than the space available, probably just a few thousandths of an inch. I know it's not very much because I just pulled the assembly out without much effort. If there was a lot of preload, it wouldn't have come out so easily. ARB sells a diff spreader for $365 that kind of looks like it costs 30 bucks to make. Call me cynical, but this may be why they're so insistent that you have one. In any case, if you can't get your diff out, or if you'd like to follow the instructions instead of the ramblings of some random asshole on the internet, then buy one of these. Once you have the assembly out, pull off the ring gear. This is a lot easier if you have an impact. You might need to put a few bolts back in and tap them in with a mallet to get the ring off. Make sure you screw them in about two turns so you don't trash your threads. Wipe off the ring gear and install it on the ARB. Line up the holes, install the bolts, and tighten them in a zigzagging pattern or a crisscross pattern or whatever the hell this pattern is. Torque spec is 70 foot-pounds, or if you're feeling lucky, whatever this thing gives you. You probably want to use thread locker on these bolts. I'm not exactly sure what would happen if one of them fell out, but I can pretty much guarantee it would be a bad day. Put the O-rings into the seal housing. You need to drill out one of the caps to get the air hose to the seal housing. Did you remember to mark the caps so you can put them back on correctly? Good. Get the right cap and drill a hole in the correct location so that the seal housing can sit inside at the right spot. This is probably a good time to drill a hole in the housing so that you can get the air hose in and out. This is a 7 16 inch drill bit and needs to be tapped with a quarter inch NPT tap. Offset it to one side so that it doesn't interfere with the ring gear. Did you offset it to the correct side? I didn't, but we haven't figured that out yet. Measure twice, cut once, or whatever. There's a shim pack that comes with a locker with an assortment of shims. You need to pick the right two shims to get the correct preload and the correct backlash. The manual will tell you to take some measurements. If you're the kind of person that likes to follow the instructions, you're probably watching the wrong video, but take a look at the instructions that come with the ARB and they'll give you the details. Basically, they want you to measure from the ring landing to the bearing landing on both the old diff and the new diff, and then measure the spacers. Do some math to figure out which of the shims to use. I found it basically impossible to make these measurements with the tools that I had, and I have a lot of tools, so I opted for the guess and test method. The shims are all different thicknesses, so I laid them out smallest to largest. I took the middle two shims out of the shim pack and put one on each side of the diff. Then I tried to tap the diff into the carrier. These shims were too wide, so I went to the next smaller two shims. With these shims, the whole assembly was snug into the carrier. Since it was harder to get the assembly in than it was to get it out, I was confident that I had enough preload. I felt pretty sure I didn't have too much preload since it just took a gentle tapping with a mallet to get it in. Differential spreader. Who needs it? We're not done with the shims yet because we have to check our backlash. Like I said before, it should be between about six and ten thousandths of an inch. What if you have too much backlash? Well, then you need to use a thicker shim on the ring side and a thinner shim on the other side. This will move the ring closer to the pinion, making them engage tighter and giving you a smaller backlash. If you don't have enough backlash, you just do the opposite. The total thickness of both shims should be the same as the total thickness of the shims you already have in there. This will maintain that awesome preload we have. I got lucky and had backlash with intolerance on the first go. Once it's all together, torque down the caps to torque spec. Uh, it's 70 foot pounds on this, or again, whatever this thing gives you. After this, you might want to double check that backlash just to be sure. Now we need to route the copper tube out of the carrier hole that we drilled. This is where I find out that I drilled the hole on the wrong side. Oh look, it's right where the ring gear is. Good job, idiot. I re-drilled a new hole in the correct location and just plugged the old hole with an NPT plug. We need to fish the copper tube around the ring gear, so just sort of bend it and pull it until it makes its way to the tapped hole. Make sure it's as far away from the ring gear as is reasonable. It won't be very far. It's all pretty tight in here. Screw the bulkhead fitting body into the carrier and cut the copper tube to length. Clean up the end and make sure it's roundish. Yes, it would have been better to use a saw or a tube cutter, but whatever. Finish installing the bulkhead fitting, install an o-ring, and then the spacer, and then the other o-ring around the copper tube. Then add the compression nut. Make sure it looks like the instructions with the tube up against the compression nut. The instructions will tell you to tighten the compression nut with a PosiDrive number no. 3 screwdriver. What? Who has a PosiDrive number no. 3 Oh, I actually have one. You could probably just use a Phillips screwdriver. 
This would be a good time to bench test the locker if you have some way to do a leak down test. Basically, you just pressurize the locker and make sure the air doesn't leak out. I didn't actually do this. You're shocked, I know, but I was feeling pretty confident about the whole thing, so I just installed it. Installation is reverse of removal at this point, so just go back to the first half of this video and watch that part backwards. I had an onboard air compressor and tank already, so I just tapped into that with a solenoid and ran the air line to the differential. I added a regulator to get the air pressure down to the recommended level. Everything worked great. I tested it around the block and the locker definitely locked, giving that unmistakable tire squeaking and hopping. And I took it out to the desert a bit later and made sure it did its locking there. I have to say, it's very nice. I've always said that A-Track was good enough, but it's totally not. Rear and center locker is definitely the way to go. Front, I'm not convinced yet, but we'll see what the future brings. Do you like your automotive ideas half-baked and questionably good? If so, hit that subscribe button, because I have a lot of them. If you enjoyed the video, please like it, and thanks for watching.